All right, welcome back everyone. So this is the third lecture in our series on Fourier transforms or fast Fourier transforms. And now I'm going to, we're going to go into kind of an in-depth example on image compression. Okay, so this is one of my favorite examples because this is really actually useful. Okay, so we can, we, at the end of this lecture, we're going to be able to take in images and compress them using fast Fourier transforms and uh, essentially store these images with way less data. Okay, so this is what's happening when you send a picture over the internet to a friend or when you are streaming a movie to your TV or your computer or your phone. You're essentially using the fast Fourier transform for image compression. Okay, this is one of my favorite lectures. Um, I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to convince you that image space, the space of all possible images, is a vast and enormous and interesting space. Okay, so let's think about this for a little bit. I want you to consider uh, an image. So consider an image, a really dinky small image that's 20 pixels by 20 pixels. And let's say that these pixels can just be black or white. Okay, black or white. Okay, so this is kind of a really simple example of these, uh, these simple images. I'm just going to draw like a little cartoon. These are so simple that you could barely, barely represent anything. You know, I'm not actually drawing 20 by 20, but this is a really, really coarse image. You could barely represent a smiley face if you wanted to. Okay, really, really simple, dinky little 20 by 20 pixel image, just black and white. How many possible black and white 20 pixel by 20 pixel images are there? How many of these images exist? So I always get different answers when I ask this in class. Some people say 400. Well, it's not, not quite right. So there, it is true that there are 400 pixels in my 20 by 20 image. But each of those pixels could either be on or off, black or white. Okay, so I really get a freedom of choice for each of those pixels of either 0 or 1, black or white. And so I have 2 to the power 400 possible images. This is huge. 2 to the power 400. This is, um, this is bigger than, uh, you know, 10 to the power 80. This is more of these little dinky images then there are nucleons in the known universe. Let me say that again. There are more dinky little 20 pixel by 20 pixel black and white images than there are you know, nucleus cores in the entire known universe. That's astronomical, uh, the definition of astronomical. So this is huge. And these are just dinky little 20 pixel by 20 pixel images, okay? So, um, if I took even larger images, so what about what about a megapixel image? So what about a one megapixel image? Right, this is something like 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. This is 1,000 by 1,000. So this is an even vaster space still. And maybe instead of just being black or white, I could have all range of colors. So I might have, I might have 1,000 numbers that describe the color. And that would be 1,000 to the power 1 million. This is a, a number that's so large we can barely even comprehend how vast this space of images is. In this image space of 1 megapixel images, we're all used to seeing what a 1 megapixel image looks like. It looks like a picture on your phone. In this space of 1 megapixel images, there exists a picture of you being born. There exists a picture of me giving this lecture right now from different angles, different camera positions. And there's an image in this image space of you sitting wherever you are watching this lecture. Okay, so this is a truly vast space where almost anything that you can picture, any natural image that you can picture exists in this image space. A picture of a mountain that you may have never seen, or a picture of a lake, or a picture at the bottom of the ocean, or at a far galaxy lives in this vast, vast uh, megapixel image space, okay? Really, really interesting. But it turns out that 
natural images, things that we see on a daily basis. So natural images, this is like mountains or people. Um, I mean, natural doesn't mean it has to be in nature. It could be, you know, a city or a circuit board or something. Just anything that you would see with your own two eyes. Natural images. Turns out that they occupy a tiny fraction of image space. And this is actually relatively easy to, to see why. So if I take my, my megapixel image or my 20 by 20 pixel image, and I just randomly start assigning values to pixels. What happens if I just flip a coin, I randomly assign a value for the color of this pixel, and then I randomly flip a coin and I assign a value to the color of that pixel, and I do that for every pixel in my image. Chances are overwhelming that if I just randomly sample an image from image space, it's going to look like TV static. So random images look like TV static. Okay, they just look like a freckly mess. Okay, and if so, I, I imagine that if I randomly sampled images from this megapixel image space, you can imagine doing this on your computer. You can even run an experiment uh, in code where you randomly generate megapixel images and then show them to yourself. You're never going to get an image of a mountain or a person or a city. You're definitely not going to get an image that makes sense. You're always going to get TV static if you randomly sample these images. Because the amount of these images that are just boring TV static dramatically outweighs the natural images. Chances are you'll never just randomly sample and get an interesting image of a natural image or of this board with math on it. Okay. And so it turns out that these natural images, even though there are a vast number of these natural images, image space is even vaster still. And most of image space is filled with random junk TV static. So these natural images only occupy a teeny tiny fraction of image space. Okay, a tiny tiny fraction of image space. And this is the entire basis for image compression. This means that most of the data in that megapixel image is actually not, um, not really that useful for describing the natural image that we're seeing because we have all of these numbers that are being used to code things like random static. Okay, so the fact that our natural images occupy such a tiny, tiny fraction of image space essentially means that we can compress almost any natural image. Okay? And the way that we do this is by exploiting the Fourier transform and working in the frequency domain. Okay? So it turns out that if I take my image, you know, if you just if you look at an image, it doesn't look like you can throw away any of the information. If I take this image, well, maybe some of the black background, but you know, if I take an image of a mountain with trees and a stream and a lake, you don't imagine that you can just throw away random pixels and still have it make sense, right? All of those pixels matter for a real image. Okay? So what we do is we take our image. This is an image in pixel space, right? This is in real pixel space, like camera space. And I take the fast Fourier transform of this image. And essentially what I get are image frequencies, right? I get the frequency component that went to building this image. And what's interesting is that in the FFT space in the frequency domain, most of these frequencies or these Fourier coefficients are going to be really small, kind of like the background noise. And there will be a few big Fourier coefficients that actually correspond to the structure in the image that we care about. Okay? And so what I can do is I can take these image frequencies and I can truncate the small values. So truncate small uh, frequencies small frequency values, small, um, I can truncate frequencies with small magnitude. And what I get is essentially a compressed image and we're still in frequency space, so we're still in frequency space. 
And so the last thing that we do is we take these compressed frequencies, we've thrown away most of the frequencies, this is just like in the two sine wave filtering example, we took and we only kept the things that were above threshold and we zeroed out all of the other small Fourier coefficients. And the last thing we need to do is do an inverse fast Fourier transform. This is not Apple's fast Fourier transform, this is an inverse fast Fourier transform. And finally, we get back an image in pixel space, but this is a compressed image. Okay? And if you just looked at the first image and the compressed image, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two to I. They would look almost identical. Except when you store a JPEG or a compressed image on your phone or on your hard drive or when you email it to someone, you're really just emailing the compressed frequencies because this is a really small list of frequencies that matter. This might be 1% of all of the frequencies that you would get doing a full fast Fourier transform. So you're only sending about 1% of the data and this dramatically compresses the amount of information that you have to store uh, to view the image. So on your hard drive, your images aren't stored in pixel space. They're stored in frequency space. And when you open an image, it rapidly inverse fast Fourier transforms and shows you the picture that makes sense to you. So this is just another reason why having this fast Fourier transform and inverse fast Fourier transform is really important so that you can rapidly decompress or rapidly compress an image. Okay? In the next two segments of this lecture, we're going to code this up and we're actually going to go from start to finish. We're going to load an image, we're going to Fourier transform it to get the frequency components. We're going to find that most of them are small and we can truncate those. 99% of them we'll get rid of. We'll only keep the, the few big frequency components. And when we inverse fast Fourier transform, we'll get a compressed image that looks pretty much like the original image. Okay, really cool idea, really fun to code up. Uh, so that's what's coming next. Okay, thank you.